Good morning, everyone. Um, I, I'm going to do uh, the, the right thing and ask my panel to join me, and we can get started with uh, a little bit of dialogue immediately. Well, good morning, Nam. We are all visitors to this place. So on behalf of the panel, I am going to acknowledge that uh, today we're um, on Wurundjeri land uh, of the Kulin Nation. Uh, I would like to recognize uh, the traditional owner's deep connection to land, water, and culture, and also reflect that beneath the concrete and the asphalt, the land was and always will be Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land. So this morning I um, have the privilege of being joined by um, some of the progressive uh, government agencies and departments uh, across the country and certainly uh, the sustainability leaders amongst them. Uh, they all have publicly stated sustainability commitments and all of them take a leaf out of the Alexis Davison playbook uh, by asking not why can't you do it, but instead, how can we do it together? Now, the Australian government has given clear direction that recycling is a vital first step in terms of moving towards a circular economy, having more resilient infrastructure, and importantly, having more sustainable and regenerative outcomes. This morning, we're going to explore what's happening um, at state and federal level, uh, and importantly, how each of us are progressing that practice. We also definitely want to engage with all of you. So if you haven't already, please connect uh, your phones with Slido so that the questions can come through. We're going to explore all four of our powerful levers to uh, drive change and particularly positive change across Australia. Uh, so there will be reflection on policy, on planning, on procurement, and importantly also on investment practice. And I think we'll get started, uh, Adam, straight with you. Now we've got um, clear indication from the federal government that there are targets through the National Waste Policy Action Plan. We've also got circular, uh, circular economy transition targets coming to the fore. And uh, earlier today, Ian Porter spoke a little bit about how all of that is starting to be integrated with our decarbonisation priorities. Uh, tell us a little bit about how Infrastructure Australia is um, looking at increasing recycled content through federally funded infrastructure projects. Thanks, Ainsley, and pleasure to be here. Um, so we know through our market capacity work that the Australian infrastructure pipeline is about $237 billion, and there's a record investment in road that I think Ian spoke to, 998 projects across 2015 to 2031, and that's 200 million tonnes of conventional materials. Um, so we did, a, Infrastructure Australia did a piece of work with um, the Department of Climate Change and Ecologic as a, um, a project partner um, on the opportunity that's available to use recycled materials across all of those road projects. And, and we found that um, uh, right now we could replace about 27% or 54 million uh, tonnes of uh, conventional materials with recycled materials. Um, and if we removed obstacles um, as we identified them, that could move to 59% or 119 million tonnes. And so uh, the obstacles from our engagement with the industry and our own policy work really fell into three or four main areas. One is um, around regulation. Um, there's a, an issue with uh, often environmental regulations, which are really important, um, uh, preventing the recycled industry from uh, developing. So for instance, processed and baled plastic can only be on site for say eight days. And, the recycling industry and uh, the standards industry needs to come together and get a better understanding of what actually needs to be done um, so that we can better balance our environmental outcomes um, and have a greater use of recycled materials. Um, 
Also, there's been a lot of talk about standards this morning. Um, we definitely identify that as a key issue. Uh, a lot of our standards um, are, are far too prescriptive in terms of the amount of conventional materials that should be made, the mix of what should be in there, and what we found is that we need to sh shift to a performance or outcome-based um, performance standards approach. Um, I was really pleased to see in our research for this panel that um, Standards Australia and the Australian Council of Recycling has done further work in this space uh, around um, what the various sort of issues are around the states and territories around replacement materials. So good to see that they're coming to the table and working together on that. And finally, um, and I actually think really importantly, there needs to be a great, greater level of market understanding of the, the opportunity available for recycled materials. Um, we can have all the collaboration at senior levels between governments that we like, but if people who are on the ground making decisions day to day about what to use um, and they don't understand what it is that they need to do um, or what the benefits are, then that just will not happen. Um, so when you look at an example like Morty Alec Freeway, which used um, 32,000 metres, installed 32,000 metres of recycled noise walls, it's about 30 million recycled water bottles, um, and the product itself is lighter, uh, quicker to install, graffiti proof, um, and it can be recycled again. You know, it kind of sells itself in a way, and we need to be telling that story to people who are actually on the ground making decisions, along with the kind of standardisation and harmonisation of standards and, and intergovernmental agreements. Well, one of the things that has been really clear for me uh, through this conference is the amount of intergovernmental collaboration and coordination that is happening. So uh, joining uh, Adam, who is the CEO of Infrastructure Australia, today we are moving up the east coast of Australia and uh, we've got Pamela Henderson joining us from Transport for New South Wales. We've also got Carly Hughes from the Department of Environment and Science in Queensland and uh, David Alexander from ACT Government. In the spirit of intergovernmental collaboration, we're going to share uh, what each of your jurisdictions is doing in terms of progressing your policy and procurement practices. Um, you're, you've collectively uh, responded to state-driven state, um, targets, but in terms of priorities and progress. Um, Pamela, maybe we can start with you. What is New South Wales up to at the moment? Okay, thank you, Ainsley. Um, we're delighted to say Transport for New South Wales, we're the largest uh, department. We, we are very fortunate to have the largest spend, so aligned with that, we're actually leading the New South Wales government agencies in regard to sustainability. We're approaching it effectively from two, two angles. One is strong policy and targets and the other element is about tangible outcomes. And we're doing that strongly with industry. We've been engaging with industry over the last 12 months to make sure that it's not just a policy on paper, but it's a workable policy and that we can achieve those um, tangible outcomes. We're currently consulting or finalising consultation on the net zero and climate change policy. Um, and the policy, unlike many policy, actually has a clear um, targets and also clear uh, milestones in that. Both net zero for the transport sector holistically for 2050, but also has some more ambitious targets such as fossil fuel free from 2040. Um, we heard from industry over our uh, engagement over the last year that industry is really keen for us to be bold, to set high targets and really set the way so industry then knows how they need to respond to the bold targets. Uh, also, cons uh, consistently feed feedback from industry is about how are we going to get there. We work with Infrastructure for New South Wales uh, on launching the 2026 decarbonising the infrastructure delivery roadmap. It is a roadmap that includes both policy from a New South Wales infrastructure perspective, but also some clear deliverables that we're achieving between now and 2026. And some of those are going to be delivered within the next, within this calendar year as well. Uh, we're also announcing a project procurement standard very soon, which will be about how we actually strongly bring sustainability into the procurement phase, because we know that procurement phase is a strong enabler of getting sustainable outcomes in our projects. I'll just also reflect upon what Ian Porter mentioned this morning about Upper Creek, um, but we have a paddle. 
Um, so although we're a jurisdiction, we're grabbing a paddle with many of our interjurisdictional members and particularly working on some of the initiatives. We're leading one of the initiatives, which is the development of the National Framework for Decarbonising Infrastructure, and we're paddling really hard to deliver that very soon so we have a national framework for decarbonisation. That's great. David, how are you paddling? Yeah, thanks, Ainsley. Um, well, it's a really exciting time for us in the ACT government um, at the moment. The government in the last few weeks released um, its first circular economy strategy and action plan, um, and that is a time frame through to 2030, which aligns with the National Waste Policy Action Plan targets. Um, one of the challenges we had, so we've been developing this, my team's been preparing this, I guess, in the last 12 to 24 months. One of the challenges we had was, well, actually, where do you start with circular economy? Because it's such a huge concept, but obviously covers everything. So we thought, actually, let's identify um, uh, a number of, uh, I guess, a, a few key focus areas where we could get some quick runs on the board, demonstrate success, and have the potential to scale activities up. So we identified um, areas such as food and organics, the built environment, which is um, very relevant to the discussions um, today and yesterday, consumer goods, emerging waste streams, as well as creating space. In the ACT, we are very limited for space for uh, waste infrastructure, for example, but also for, uh, I guess, circular economy enterprises as well. Um, one of the challenges as well is, I suppose, um, my team is, is a waste-focused team, but circular economy is much broader than, than that. So um, our challenge was to bring as many um, areas from across government into the tent, and it's really pleasing to see with our action plan that actually Yes, there's a focus on recycling, but we actually go further up the waste hierarchy to reuse, repair, repurpose, and design in particular. Um, so that's really exciting. That's meant that we've actually got a, a wide range of government stakeholders um, participating in delivering actions um, into the future. Um, in terms of a couple of targets in relation to the National Waste Policy Action Plan, which link with our strategy, um, the, action, the National Waste Policy Action Plan has targets around uh, phasing out unnecessary and problematic uh, plastics, which we're doing through phasing out single-use plastics along with other jurisdictions. Um, there's, uh, I think, the first target of the National Waste Policy Action Plan is about the ban on exporting waste. Um, unfortunately, our material recovery facility burnt down on Boxing Day last year, so the government's in the process of building a new one, or undertaking the process to build uh, a new one as soon as possible, but that will have the capacity to to sort, um, separate and process material from um, Canberra and the wider region. So um, we're, we're very much looking forward to, to progress in that space as well. Um, and um, there's a target in the National Waste Policy Action Plan around reducing um, the amount of food waste going to landfill by 50% by 2030. Um, in the last couple of years, the government has been trialling or piloting a, a 5,000 household food organics and garden orders garden organics collection, um, which has proved very successful, very low contamination rates, lots of participation in readiness for a citywide rollout. Um, and the strategy highlights that um, the government's going to invest in an industrial scale processing facility to, um, I guess, uh, facilitate that citywide um, uh, ro rollout of the FOGO service. And that obviously will help us reduce our greenhouse gas um, emissions quite significantly as well. In the ACT, we have a net zero target um, uh, by 2045, um, and as we reduce our emissions from transport and gas, waste will um, become an increasing proportion, so that's going to contribute to that as well. So that's probably just a, a flavour of that, uh, of what's happening in the ACT, um, but I think certainly our next uh, steps are to re-engage with our, um, uh, particularly our industry and business stakeholders, um, uh, to how we go about implementing some of the actions within the uh, plan as well. Thanks, David. Kylie, what's happening in Queensland? Oh, so much is happening in Queensland. David stole my line. It's a really exciting time. Um, one of the, the recent things that we've done uh, in Queensland is amend our Waste Reduction and Recycling Act to include circular economy principles 
as part of the legislation. Uh, so we, we have had the transition to a circular economy as a strategic priority in our waste management and resource recovery strategy, uh, but we've elevated it into the legislation so that we can, um, I guess, have a, a broader ranging conversation around um, you know, circular economy initiatives, including circular economy considerations in decisions that are made around infrastructure and, and projects and, um, and other initiatives that, that follow on. Um, we have in our waste strategy um, several priority focus areas um, that include tyres, glass, built environment, plastics, organics, e-products and textiles. I think I got them all. Uh, so we're, we're systematically going through and developing action plans for all of those key areas. Uh, the action plans are designed to focus on the top end of the hierarchy predominantly, so we're looking at avoidance and design um, initiatives and then into the reuse, repair, refurbishment, uh, reprocessing um, and then recycling and looking at you know, as much as we can keeping the value of the end-of-life products in the economy for as long as possible. Uh, we have also, as part of the amendments to the Act, made an amendment to our definition of waste. Uh, and there was a lot of sort of discussion yesterday around some of the um, how do we change the, the narrative and the language from things being a waste into them being a resource. Um, so what we've provided in that definition of waste is the ability to prescribe something to not be a waste through regulation so that we can shift the dial and hopefully change some of the perception of, um, I guess, processes but also end users that this is not a waste, it's actually a resource and it's a valuable resource that can be um, used in uh, many applications. Um, I suppose uh, two um, recent announcements from Queensland. One of them was the expansion of our container refund scheme to include glass wine and pure spirit bottles. Uh, so from the 1st of November this year, they will be eligible for a 10 cent refund. Um, part of the reason for doing that was that a lot of glass is still ending up in landfill or in low value uh, uses. So we wanted to provide the ability for a, a cleaner source separated stream of glass to come through so that it would be available for uh, bottle to bottle but also for uh, some of the, the other um, products like um, you know, manufacturing uh, glass insulation. Um, there will always be a need for glass to be um, you know, manufactured into it, things like a sand replacement. Um, Queensland's geography means it's not always economic to bring it back to uh, the bottle manufacturing facility in Brisbane. Um, and we do have uh, a number of, of very good quality glass processing plants in our major regional centres that are making a very good uh, sand and aggregate replacement product. Um, but we also do know that the material that's coming through material recovery facilities, you can get about a 40% yield of glass from that material coming through the container refund scheme is about a 90 plus percent yield and that's that's where we want to be to maximise the, the use of that material. Um, and the other recent announcement was uh, announcement of funding for a state of the art regional material recovery facility on the Sunshine Coast, which for those of you not familiar with Queensland, it's just north of Brisbane. Uh, that will provide a regional solution for uh, the councils in that region um, and provide a much uh, better uh, sorting of, of the MRF material or the curbside material so that we can optimise some of the, uh, the quality of the product coming through. Um, and I think so, so many more things, but I might just... Oh, I did forget the most important one. Um, we have been working over the last 12 months with our regional uh, councils, and there, there are nine regions in Queensland to develop regional waste management and resource recovery plans. Um, a lot of that focus is on looking at where... Um, where the gaps in the infrastructure are that are going to be needed to be able to process material locally in regions rather than having the, the transport um, 
uh, I guess, difficulties and the economic challenges of transporting um, you know, products like, like tyres or like soft plastics or, or, or glass um, back down into the southeast Queensland corner. Um, if you look at the sides of Queensland, it's uh, 1,200 kilometres from Cairns to Brisbane. So, uh, you know, some of those challenges, uh, we can find solutions in the regional area um, to help with some of those, um, I guess, local opportunities. But thank you. Thanks, Kylie. Um, you mentioned the importance of language, and I think uh, changing language can be a really powerful way to accelerate change. Um, if we have a look at the resource efficiency outcomes that were delivered just in the last financial year, uh, what we've seen is that they're close to 98% diversion of waste from landfill uh, in the infrastructure projects that are being mandated to measure that level of performance across the country. But there are also many other ways to create behaviour change and, and Ian started the day talking about the importance of having a culture towards those kind of outcomes. Now we've got the use of recycled content um, which is really coming to the fore, it's starting to mainstream. Uh, closely followed by that will be how we actually make that um, more circular and actually drive business models that support circularity. Decarbonisation has been a strong theme uh, throughout this conference and this week we've seen the launch of TNFD and the importance of having nature-based solutions integrated into what we're doing. All of that is coming at us at the same time. Um, you've touched on how policy is going to be an important lever for you. What else could we do to accelerate the kind of behaviour change that we need, particularly in infrastructure where uh, there is a propensity not necessarily to focus on outcomes which include do nothing, build nothing? Um, what's the importance of starting from the outset? What can we do? Actually, well, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, it's it incredibly important thing that we focus on the behavioural change at the early front end of a project, at that cradle stage. We've all seen the curves of influence between life cycle and the ability to influence and sustainable, sustainable outcomes is no different. The earlier we bring sustainable thinking, carbon minimisation into the life cycle of a project, um, the more influence and effect we will have. So it's changing um, where, when we think about it and how we think about it. We've actually been looking at introducing a whole of life carbon, carbon estimates at the strategic options phase to actually value that whole of life, look at the different options, what is the, the trade-off between the different options, noting your comment as well about the do nothing, but should we have to go down a do something option, what is the optimal outcome from a carbon and sustainability perspective. We've also worked with um, New South Wales Treasury to look at putting a, a higher price on carbon value, and that's now been increased to $123 per tonne in New South Wales, and that will be importantly included in, in with embodied emissions and will be included at the strategic and cost-benefit analysis at the strategic ops and fund. Faces. Um, Ainsley, we've recently had conversations over the last year with industry about what we need to do to go on this sustainability journey together. One of the other elements is about technical and capable uplift. We've talked about that in a video series that's recently been released about the behaviour needs to come with capability uplift, needs to come with capacity uplift to actually understand the sustainability challenge and how we work on that together. I think, um, <clears throat> based on what you're saying as well, like what gets measured gets done. And I think traditionally in business cases, we haven't captured the um, effects on the environment very well, if at all. Um, and so that's why the work that New South Wales is doing, but also the work that IA is doing around developing a national carbon value and having that thinking in the earlier stages of a project around what the carbon impact is and just, just capturing that so you can see it and you can make a decision based on all the trade-offs on what people's housing needs are and travel time savings are, but also what's the carbon impact of this. And that can really change the way in which you look at solving the problem that you've identified. Uh, and it could be do nothing, or it could be pricing, or it could be um, 
some sort of techn technological solution that has a lower carbon value, or it could be we just have to build another lane on a road. But um, just capturing it and measuring it and having that understanding can really help decision makers make those trade-offs because currently they're completely blind or almost completely blind to what actually the impacts are. Any thoughts? Carly, David? We might move on to the next one um, while you're thinking about that. The, I think if we, if we take a, a leaf out of um, Victoria's book, it has been a choice about um, pace and progress over perfection. Um, getting started with policy is a great approach. Um, and then embedding these kind of outcomes in procurement is absolutely delivering um, outcomes. And what we've seen, again, if we look at the last financial year and the kind of project outcomes which are be being delivered on the ground, we've seen a 30% uh, reduction in life cycle material emissions just because that's starting to be required up front. But there does need to be visibility. There's been calls for putting um, carbon in the business case and it's great to see that coming to the fore in various different ways. Uh, that is going to drive more and more um, circular kind of behaviour. But from a challenge perspective, maybe David and Kylie, are you seeing anything that is um, perhaps prohibiting or going to be a barrier to get the work that you're doing off the ground? I think one of the challenges from my perspective is still um, building people's trust in the system. Um, we've seen I, I guess a lot of things happen in recent times that mean that people don't trust that their recyclables are being recycled, um, that they don't trust some of the, the claims of businesses that they're doing what they claim that they're doing. There's a lot of greenwashing that is potentially still out there. So I think it's, it, is, is, it is building that, that trust back up and then... Um, I guess doing what we say that we're going to do, so that it's and bringing people along on the journey, um, and, and part of that is changing the mindset away from things being a waste um, and telling the story about the the product and you know, your your TV that you um, need has come to its end of life. There are these um, reuse or repair or recovery pathways, and it can be turned into new product and it as a whole new life. Um, I think one of, the, one of the biggest challenges for Queensland is definitely the size of Queensland. And we have very remote communities and we have First Nations communities that do struggle with engaging in the conversation because they feel their, um, their volumes of materials are too small, no one wants to come and collect it. It's a long way to bring it for processing. Um, but we, we have worked with a few First Nations councils and one of the ones that's been a really good success story uh, was Palm Island, which is near Townsville. Um, it's an island, obviously. Um, and the project that we worked with them on uh, as a pilot was a concrete recovery project. So everything that's generated on that island was previously coming off island at huge expense to the council. Um, so we worked with them to develop a concrete recovery uh, project, um, funded a bit of kit for them to be able to crush the concrete, demolish um, old concrete buildings so that it could all be turned back into uh, aggregate um, to work into their um, new footpaths project, but also they want to turn all of their bitumen roads into concrete. So um, being able to utilise that material on island was a great saving for them, not only in cost, but also in not having to bring aggregate, virgin aggregate, onto the island. Um, and it created 11 island jobs. So those sorts of things as a pilot, we now want to roll that out as a model for other um, First Nations councils to, uh, to look at in their own communities. But, yeah. Thanks, Kylie. I had the privilege of listening to Michael Bizzle talk about that yeah. very example two weeks ago. Uh, really, really inspiring. Mm. David, from your perspective, um, any reflections on barriers, challenges, or potentially what you might be doing to use procurement as a lever? Procurement as a lever, yeah. It's certainly one that we see as very important. Um, in the ACT, 
Um, the minister who's actually responsible for recycling waste reduction and, and circular economy is also responsible for procurement, so that's a helpful start. Um, this is a sustainable procurement guide which has been in place for I think about eight or so years now, but that's going to be renewed. One of the commitments we, we have for the circular economy work is to develop a new circular economy and procurement um, guide, um, which I, and so I think that also goes to the sort of the um, education and, and, and even awareness raising the, around the opportunities that not just recycle content but around the, the reuse, the repurposing, the repairing um, and better design. Um, what we're looking, and obviously as a um, deliverer of major um, civil infrastructure projects in the ACT, the government does have a, have a large opportunity um, through the light rail um, project which um, is underway and also some of our housing developments. Um, we're really looking at um, best practice circular economy design and opportunities at the outset, which I think is very important um, to get that right. Um, one example would be um, the Canberra Theatre uh, redevelopment, which is um, in its early stages and uh, thinking around the design, thinking about adaptive reuse of what's there uh, and repurposing and, and concepts like that. So yeah, I think it's a very important um, lever and one which we're certainly looking to utilise. One of the things that's notable is that each of your policies has a slightly different nuance as to how you might be taking things forward. Um, I'm quite keen to hear how you're working together and perhaps, Adam, we can throw the first question from our audience to you, um, mm. which reflects on the success of Ecologics Recycle First program and how that might be deployed more on a national basis. What are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, Ecologic and Recycle First, the policies in Victoria, uh, I think are very influential at the federal level in terms of the thinking that was done. Um, <clears throat> in my engagement in Victoria, I, I, I had heard that it was not without its growing pains as well when it was introduced. And, um, you know, you, using procurement as a lever is incredibly powerful, but you've got to make sure that you can actually ensure that the whole value chain can deliver on what the, the actual uh, procurement target is. And I know in Victoria, they, they had to do a little bit of work you know, in looking at, um, you know, you've got the market and you've got the procurement target, but the people who are delivering it, recycling it, getting the quality of material right and all that sort of thing and doing investment into that. Um, I think without getting ahead of, of what government may decide, there, there is an active conversation, inter-jurisdictional conversation occurring around the National Partnership Agreement negotiations around um, recycled materials um, and the work that uh, Ecologic and the Recycle First is, is very influential in that conversation. Um, so uh, not getting ahead of government, but it's definitely an active um, conversation that's occurring um, over the coming 12 months. And how are you working together collectively as jurisdictions? What are some of the examples where you are um, collaborating and sharing some of your lessons? Uh, I, I'm not sure there is a thing as a perfect policy and working with industry and letting them know that you are there to iterate um, as things evolve. Um, how are you learning from one another? I think one of the coming to this conference has been incredibly useful for me from Queensland to be able to take back some of the information um, around the like just the um, the I'll, I'll get the terminology wrong, but having the um, the recycle first plans being able to be used as a tool to um, go out to market to explain. Well, if, if you're not going to use recycled content, then you have to explain why you can't use recycled content instead of the default being, we're not going to use it because it's too expensive. Um, so having that as, a, as, I think, an ability to be able to um, then lean into our own procurement policy to, to build that in as a, uh, an opportunity to get more uptake of recycled content, to build in some of the circular economy outcomes um, is, is a really powerful thing. Um, the, the opportunity for our, our regional areas is, um, is brought in there as well so that there's actually that uh, that connection along the whole supply chain and, in, and you're not just creating a solution for the major uh, population centres. Similarly in New South Wales, one of the reasons we're here is to, to learn from our, um, our interstate peers. 
We, as I also mentioned before, we're actively involved in the ITEM process, so the Infrastructure Transport Minister's meetings outcomes, and we bring our strength to areas and we also bring our learning to other areas, so the area we're bringing our strength is around the decarbonisation of infrastructure. I think what we've also done innately over the last year, we've engaged with industry. We've engaged with over 370 um, industry partners and 135 organisations. And industry in and of itself brings part of that into jurisdictional learnings. Um, one of the elements we did introduce was sustainable innovation options. So noting one of the questions before was about mandatory requirements. We were actually looking at how we can mandate a need to have sustainable outcomes, but not mandating what that outcome would be. So our industry partners can bring their ideas from Victoria, bring their ideas from Queensland, and bring that into a project which is their strength that they've learnt from interstate, but creating a sustainable outcome, which then enables the innovation to keep rolling forward on our projects. We actually had a project which was Albion Park Rail Bypass, which is about 100 k's out of Sydney, so a regional project. Um, the, the delivery partners, our industry partners, actually brought innovation to that. Part of what they'd um, learnt from interstate, but also what was um, relevant to New South Wales. And on that project alone, we had 1.1 million tonnes of recycling on it. 500 tonnes of that was just by using coal wash, the, one of the lowest grades of coal out, um, outcomes from mining outcomes, but using it directly on the project. Every layer of that road project had actual recyclable outcomes. And that was just by putting something like innovation into the project and requesting um, solutions from our partners rather than mandating. Mm. And then measuring them so that you've got those facts so you can see the kind of progress that you're Precisely. making. Uh, innovation is key to um, driving the use of new products, um, looking at how we source new products, uh, what those those might be. Um, referring back to that question around mandating, having more of an outcomes focus is often quite important when you are going to start mandating the use of approved recycled content. Um, any reflections from ACT or Queensland um, in terms of how you're approaching innovation and also mandating recycled content? Maybe I can speak to the innovation in particular. That's um, mm. one of the, our key strategic objectives of um, the circular economy strategy released was um, uh, innovation. Um, we're very keen to take a regional approach and to collaborate, especially with our, our local councils surrounding Canberra and New South Wales uh, more widely on circular economy and how in particular we can bring innovative new enterprises into the ACT and the region. Um, so that's, uh, we've actually identified that something we'll do is to scope out some potential locations for, for a potential precinct to set up to encourage um, these sorts of enterprises to come um, into the ACT. We're also looking at um, setting up a grassroots um, grants program um, to encourage innovation, particularly uh, for, for not-for-profit social enterprises, small businesses, because what we heard when we talk to um, those sort of sectors uh, was actually a need to, um, for a bit of, just a little bit of support to continue their, their innovations and activities and expand a little bit further as well. Excellent. Um, I, I think part of it for me is really like, and again, some of it comes back to, to language that goes out in, in tenders and expressions of interest where Rather than mandating, are you, are you saying instead, well, I guess instead of saying, well, we prefer that you use recycled content, more around we will preference recycled content, um, and it, it, a bit comes back to the, well, explain to us why you can't use recycled content. Um, some of, the, some of the, the real issues in Queensland are it might not be available in some of the very remote areas, but then there is an opportunity to develop some of that capacity as well. So um, I think there's, there's opportunities through procurement to drive innovation and drive investment um, and, and look at where, I guess, where, where government can intervene, um, the most appropriate places for government to intervene and where we just need to get out of the way and let industry do what they do best. Um, and I think a lot of it is around the, the performance outcomes rather than mandating a specific like, material or um, 
But yeah, if, if, if this performs as well as this, why are we putting blockers in the way? You've all said it's a great time to be in infrastructure and it's an even better time uh, to be in sustainability and driving these kind of outcomes. If there was one thing that you could do in the next 12 months, what would it be? And David, we might start with you and circle back. Sure. Uh, more engagement with um, governments, industry, business, community and research sectors. Um, if we really want to get to a circular economy, all of us have to participate. Um, and we all have uh, roles um, to play in that. Uh, next 12 months. Well, we're, we're doing a, a big piece of work around baseline in Queensland circular economy um, position at the moment and developing metrics to measure the impact of circular economy outcomes. So the biggest thing for me, I think, is then embedding that work into business as usual so that we've, we've started the transition. Now let's just do it. Uh, over and above the kind of work that's occurring in terms of um, measuring it in the, in the business case, uh, what I would love to see at least the start of the, ne of the next 12 months is um, a pathway to harmonised, standardised standards for outcomes-based standards. Um, you know, a, a working group or something to actually go down that pathway because I just think it's such an important way to um, change the way in which we think about um, uh, recycled materials and how we build infrastructure. And it's not just about recycled materials, it's also about decarbonisation. So having a requirement that you build tunnels with three metres of cement thickness, say, there's a whole decarbonisation piece that you need to think about with that. Are there materials out there that perform just as well um, um, with less carbon intensive? You know, I, I just think that is a really important piece that we should start that journey on as, much, as quickly as possible. I think for New South Wales, it's action. So we've had a year-long engagement with industry. We've developed our policy. We've developed our standards. They are eminently to be published. We had our budget announced yesterday. There's well over 70 billion still in the transport sector, and it's bringing those sustainable outcomes in the policy and also the standards to life across that program of work. So it's action. So engagement, action, and nationally consistent outcomes-based standards. Please join me in thanking our panel. <laughs>